I moved into my flat in late August with my partner and I've had uh, experiences and seen things and heard things and felt things throughout my whole life but didn't believe and just chalked everything down to scientific reasons. This apartment block has six lots in it and two occupied on the bottom floor and mine on the top floor. I'm not sure the order that these happened in because they occurred over a month timeline but this is what happened. So the first thing that happened was my partner was in the bath and I was lying on the bed in the spare room, nice view mind you, and I heard her shout my name. It was a loud call and it was questioning as if she had heard a knock or something and was calling my name, asking if I was outside the door. I walked to the door and asked what she wanted and she played dumb. She said, I haven't shouted to you. No, I don't need anything. While I was stood on the outside of the bathroom door too, the, the door handle started moving up and down and it, it was as if she was testing the door to make sure it was still locked or something. I thought that maybe she was letting me in thinking that I needed the toilet or something. But no, whilst the door handle was moving, I heard that unmistakable slosh sound of somebody moving around in the bathtub. She must have sat up and turned around in the tub too because she called, what do you want? I'm in the bath, give me 10 minutes. Dumbfounded, I, I just walked back to the spot in the spare room thinking that surely she was just playing some sort of trick on me. Again, my partner was in the bathroom another time cleaning her teeth. She has this thing where she cleans them OTT and flosses and mouthwash and some weird brush thing and just everything. I do the generic two minutes and mouthwash rinse and then I'm out. And... I left the bathroom and thought, I know, I'll hide in the dark living room so she'll come to bed and not see me and check the living room where I'll jump out and make her jump. I heard the bathroom door unlock, open and close and saw a shadow on the wall move down the hallway around the corner and continue down the hallway wall. The hallway has no windows, no doors were open and the only light source is the light bulb and there were no bugs that cast a shadow or anything and... I saw a woman's shadow with, in my mind, a, a beak-like face. I jumped out, ready to scare my partner, and there was no one there. On a third occasion, while sleeping, I've, I've been woken up by my partner moaning during a nightmare too. The two that stood out to me was that she was awake in a dream, and there were lights swirling around the room making face-like shapes, and she felt that they were a threatening presence. The next, she again woke up, and actually still asleep though, and there was an old woman-like figure above her just looking back at her. The fourth occurrence was that uh, my partner had gone to the toilet during the night, 3am. When she came back, she found me sitting up in bed fast asleep still, and I turned to her and apparently said, the spirits are here with us tonight. And then I just laid back down and carried on sleeping leaving her wide awake and terrified all night. The fifth time, I was in bed and it must have been 2 or 3am I think, and I rolled over and put my arm around my partner and cuddled in closer. Suddenly, the door opens which makes me shoot up in bed in fight or flight mode and there's a figure in the doorway. I jump up and I shout, what the fuck? And my partner, who was in the doorway, replies, it's me, it's me, I went to the toilet. Well, I'm now lost because literally two seconds prior, I had put my arm around her in bed. I'm sure of it. I looked back and her side of the bed is empty and just completely void. So the sixth thing that happened, and to be quite honest, the most frightening was an actual sighting. We had a bit of an argument over her trying to wash up at 9pm when I said that I would do it the next day don't touch my chores and I just thought fuck this I'll just go to bed and so I just went off and laid my phone down for 15 minutes before I just dropped off to sleep. It was around one hour later that I was stirred awake as if she'd come to the room and was getting changed for bed and woken me up. I lay there for a second just looking at the space next to me, the curtain, and then I realized that there was nobody actually in the room. There was no noise or movement. So I, I shuffled around to look around the room and lifted my head when behind the door, about seven feet up, around the doorframe height, was this 
whitey greenish blur. I still had sleep in my eye, so I squinted and blinked a couple of times and tried to focus my eyes until the blur came sharper and it was a, a literal woman-like figure just staring back at me. It took me a second or two to process what was going on as my brain went through the there's something in the room, shit, intruder, no, something's actually watching me. But what felt like a minute passed and then it, it moved towards me. It blended into what I can only describe as a, a sunlight glare hitting your windshield whilst driving and as this beam was at the edge of the bed it just dissipated into nothingness. As this happened, the door swung open too and my partner was on the other side and it brought me back into the room and holy shit, I've, I've never been so scared in my life. I screamed, like literally screamed and I was actually shaking a bit. I was pointing at the corner shouting about something is there, something, uh, an old woman, she was there. Of course, it had gone at this point but with nightmares and even sleep paralysis... The experiences leave you and you get that it was a dream and you just kind of go on. But this, this was different. And I'm now genuinely frightened when I'm in the flat alone. I have to have the lights on in certain rooms and I'm constantly checking over my shoulder or in every reflection in case something is there again. I can't be in the bedroom alone without a light on too and I can't sleep without my head firmly under the covers, or at least the covers pulled up enough so that I can't see that area of the room. I'm a 26-year-old bodybuilding part-time boxer that isn't scared of much, and I just... I can't really explain this. After this sighting, though, I've, uh, I've tried to shield myself from anything further, but... The Saturday before Halloween, I threw a party. One of my friends crashed the night, and in the morning, I got a WhatsApp message from him saying, stop knocking on the wall, my head is right there, I'm trying to sleep. Mind you, I, I wasn't knocking, and in fact, there's a cupboard against the wall where he was, so it would have been supremely awkward for me to knock that wall anyway. After this, when I got home from work, I, feeling completely stupid and awkward doing it too, said... If there is anything in this space that is not myself or my partner, then leave now. You're not welcome and you have to go. And no lie, I walked into the living room and there was no change in temperature, but my body just felt freezing. I had goosebumps and the hairs were stood up on end and I actually thought I had angered whatever it was or something and it was now going to be worse. But touch wood, there's been nothing so far. I'm a long time lurker, hoping that I would never have a story to share, but unfortunately, two weeks ago, it started. In hindsight, I, I guess it started a long time ago, though. So, my now husband and I moved in together almost four years ago to a rather nice, albeit expensive apartment complex in a, a sort of nice part of town. But we're on the third floor with a large balcony that looks out into the courtyard in which other apartments in the complex are located. Basically, you can see the other balconies and living rooms of the other tenants and the open stairwells too. So, uh, you went by without a hitch and my husband works at a bar so he comes home late while I usually make it home around 5. It's easy to get to any apartment doorway as the complex is large and open with no security doors except the door to the apartment. So, this all started in August of 2016. I would be home after work just chilling and watching TV and almost always around 9.30 I could hear someone come up the stairs. But things would be quiet and all of a sudden there were loud sharp knocks on my door. I didn't move because it was startling but eventually went to look at the peephole and there stood three people all with black hoodies on all seemingly staring at the peephole like they could see me. Obviously I... I didn't answer the door and after a while they just left. Q a few weeks later, same time, but this incident there were footsteps and then loud hard bangs on the door and they sent my cat flying to hide. I sat, frozen, but said to myself, maybe the police? I made it to the peephole once again and this time staring out at one person, dark hoodie, 
male, white and very, very gaunt with huge black eyes. Again, I didn't answer the door and grabbed a kitchen knife that I kept by my side until my husband came home. This continued for weeks and even once when my husband was home. But he proceeded to look out the peephole and saw the same man and screamed for him to leave and he did. We called maintenance and the police who both stated that they would do regular patrols but nothing else and suggested cameras and that was it. Everything stopped for a while, maybe six months during the winter which helped me uh, be at ease because when all of this was happening I was having a very hard time sleeping and stopped going out at night too. However, I assumed the same man started up again except this time the same large bangs on the door would happen but when I would look out the peephole no one was there. I then became horrified as I started to notice extinguished cigarette butts by the side of my door like someone was standing and just waiting there. Again, I reported it and security stepped up in the area, but I uh, still didn't feel safe. I was hoping that it would just stop as I felt tortured in my own home, but as I realized two weeks ago, things could be much worse. At night to go to bed, I would have to cross our eating area, which was right in front of our giant glass sliding door that led out to our balcony. It was late at night, lights off in the apartment, and... As I walk by, I, I glance over and across the courtyard and I see the man standing on the landing of the stairs across the way from the second to third floor just staring right at my balcony. Just standing there, unmoved, facing in the direction of me, the same man at my door. I went numb, heart racing, chilled to the bone and I know that he couldn't have seen me because the lights were off and the stairway had lights of its own but... I was still scared shitless. I obviously called my husband who rushed over but the man had left. More reports to the front office were made and more promised security patrols were made too. This same creepy dead-eyed man in the black hoodie just continued to stand at the stairway landing just staring at my apartment and it's now been two weeks and he does it every Friday. I'm horrified and I've been having awful nightmares about someone breaking in and just strangling me in my sleep. I don't know what he's doing there or what his deal is but I wish he would just leave. So uh these are not in chronological order or anything they're just in the order that I can remember them. The first story was in high school and we moved into an old two-story house. The upstairs was originally an attic but had recently been turned into three bedrooms and a small bathroom. The floors were very thin and old as hell so when someone walked around you could both hear and feel the steps. And after living there for several years you could tell where someone was walking upstairs just by the feel of the floor. Anyways, so one night I'm Laying in my bed, just a mattress laying directly on the floor, watching TV and my best friend comes over, super drunk and needing a place to stay so that she won't get in trouble by her mum for coming home obviously drunk. Okay, cool, so she borrows some of my clothes and passes out fairly quickly as she was hammered. I fall asleep soon after and I awake to my direct TV remote lighting up and it was literally right next to my face and... I just pushed it away as weird things often occur, but I've never had any bad vibes or anything. I turn over and as soon as I stop moving, I, I feel the floor moving from someone walking from my door towards the window, which is a straight path at the bottom of my mattress. It walks from the door to the window and back again several times as if it were pacing or contemplating life or something. Mind you, I, I never once opened my eyes. No way. I tried to wake my friend too up with nudges from my elbow, but she was, uh, she was passed out cold from drinking all night. And this thing just paced back and forth from my door to the window, and I'm not sure how many times, but it finally stops at the window, not at all the place I wanted it to stop, and once again, I, I never look. I pull the blanket up over my head, and eventually I, I fall asleep, and... I wake up super pissed at my friend. So the second story was that one night in the same house, 
I was alone in the house, which I'd already hated being alone in anyways, and my parents are out at the casino all weekend and my brothers are out living their lives while I have no plans and I'm just at home watching TV in the living room downstairs. The way the living room was set up is uh, a little bit odd, but what I assume was originally intended to be a dining room is now our living room and what was intended to be the living room is now my parents' bedroom. Their bedroom had two sliding doors and they always left one of the doors closed and had one of their dresses partially blocking it, while the other door was always left open. So I was sitting on the couch, which is adjacent to their bedroom, and I'm kind of laying sideways on the couch with my head turned towards the TV, just chilling, and out of the corner of my eye, I, I see what appeared to be a, a little flash. Not quite as dramatic as a camera flash, but it's still pretty bright, mind you. I obviously immediately turned my attention towards their room, and... I see a, a black shadow move from the door that's open towards the door that's closed where the dresser is. I just stare scared shitless and I saw it straight on, not out of the corner of my eye or anything. I mean, I actually saw it and I crawl backwards away from the door over the arm of the couch, grab my car keys and I just bail. I didn't even put a bra on or socks or turn anything off. I just got in my car and drove to my friend's house, which was almost 20 miles away. I told my mother about it the next morning when she got home and suggested that we buy cameras so that we can see it, but she refused. She said, no way I'm doing that. When I see it on camera, we'll have to move. I never saw any kind of shadow thing before or since then, but that one was pretty creepy. So, the last story is that, in the middle of the day, me and my friends had decided that we didn't need to go to school this day, so we are at my house, and the whole house we have to ourselves, and we're sitting at the kitchen table just talking. My brother's friend comes in, we lived in the middle of nowhere, and never had the locks on the doors or anything, and our friends were allowed to come in and out any time they wanted without having to knock or anything, and asked if my brother was here. I said I wasn't sure, and... He goes up the stairs to check and I hear him walk into my brother's room, search and then start to head out of his room. He closes the door behind him and it closes a little louder than he intended and he yells out sorry and a very loud booming voice from somewhere upstairs says stop slamming the fucking doors. And me and my friend just look at each other with a what the fuck look and my brother's friend comes flying down the stairs and says okay bye without looking at us and just runs out the door. He was and is a very religious guy and no matter how much we asked him to tell us if he saw anything, he would just leave the conversation every time. So I'm not sure if he actually saw anything but he definitely heard what we heard too. I don't know what was going on in that house but for the longest time I, I thought I was going crazy because I was the only one that saw things. But that last story, it confirmed for me that I wasn't going crazy. There was actually something in that house. So I work in a McDonald's in the UK and the area my Maccas is in isn't the best. But there's a lot of druggies, alcoholics and just uh, overall idiots who cause trouble. I'm usually pretty good at fending for myself and shaking things off but this encounter really really freaked me out. So, it was a couple of weeks ago and I was working on the drive through window where you collect your food. It's not uncommon for guys to make sexual comments or innuendos when they come through drive through because they don't really have to face any consequences or anything. However, this one guy came through drive through and commented on my beautiful BJ lips and asked me to meet him out back to put them to good use. I declined in the politest way I could manage and told him to move along as he was holding up the queue of cars. He moved and I thought that that was the end of the ordeal. Five minutes later though, the same dude comes around again and makes even more sexual comments about me, my hair and all the creepy things that he'd like to do to me. They were quite disturbing too and really disgusting. So bad in fact that I'm not going to mention them. But they were mostly about things that he'd do to me which... It seemed more like uh, torture methods than sexual acts. 
and needless to say I was shocked and quite visibly sickened as he drove off and I told my manager that I felt uncomfortable by this customer and asked to be moved to a different station in case he came back around. And apparently he did too because the boy who switched stations with me also had an encounter with this guy. He was asked where I was, what my name is, if this guy would give him my phone number and if he knew where I lived and what time I finished. The boy, thankfully, only told him my name and that I had been moved onto the front counter before he realized this guy was a total freak and decided to not say anything more. This is where the story gets really weird for me though. The creepy guy came into the store and came up to the till that I was stationed on. He made similar remarks about what he wanted to do to me if he were to ever get his hands on me and he didn't stop until other customers interrupted him and told him to back off and walk away because I was getting really upset and shaken. He wouldn't leave so I tried to walk away which is when this guy tried to jump over the counter to get to my side of the store. Luckily my managers and a few other staff members grabbed a hold of him and stopped him getting near me but... That didn't stop him from fighting back and still trying to touch me and get near me. At one point, he was clawing at my co-workers with his long nasty nails. Other members of staff alerted the staff safe, a sort of panic button that connects us right to the police who are sent right away. Unfortunately, because I work in a rough area, police patrol very closely to where I work so they managed to get to the store pretty quick. They detained the guy but they also found knives stashed all over his body. Army knives, pocket knives, and even just small regular kitchen knives. As they were dragging him away, he continued to scream about how he was going to wait outside the store for me every day and that we belonged together and just screaming all the rantings of just a madman. My manager sent me home in a taxi and I've never seen this guy, his car, or anything else of his again, which I thank my lucky stars for. I don't know if he was just on drugs or if he was actually insane or what his deal was, but the fact that he had knives on him and made so many threats and even jumped over the counter, I honestly think that he meant business. In early 2007, I was freshly 18 and newly married living in Fort Polk, Louisiana, while my husband was training at Fort Benning. I was born and raised in Alaska, so living in continental US was a vastly new experience for me. My husband had a weekend off, though he wasn't allowed to leave the base, so we bought a Greyhound bus ticket for me to visit him and meet the soldiers that he became friends with. I had never been on a Greyhound bus before, but... I was excited to drive through the south and see new places and have my own little adventure. Sure, there were some creeps that bothered me on the bus and at the stations, but I still had interesting conversations and met new people and just generally enjoyed the experience. Regardless of the time, each station we stopped at was open and offered food too and outlets for charging and bathrooms and whatnot. So, when we arrived in Columbus, Georgia at about 2am... I expected the station to be open, but it wasn't. Everyone else who ended their journey there had a ride waiting for them, and suddenly I was completely alone outside a locked building in the middle of downtown Columbus, fully dark and terrified. I didn't know what to do, and my phone was nearly dead from the last long leg of the travel, and I thought about walking to a gas station, but I uh, had no idea which direction to go, and... I couldn't see any nearby lit buildings. I truly expected the station to be open and thinking that I would just stay there for a bit while my phone charged and I had something to eat and could have access to a phone to book a so-called cab or something. But all I had was a, an old sign hanging on the side of the building with incomplete phone numbers for taxi companies. The numbers had faded, been scraped off and defaced and there was only one complete phone number and it was handwritten in a sharpie at the top of the list. Better than nothing, right? Wrong. I called the number and a guy answered, casual and sleepy, asking who I was, and I apologized explaining that I was trying to call a cab, and when the guy perked up immediately and said, Oh yeah, that's me, I'm on my way. 
but my phone died 10 minutes after I'd made the call and it was another 15 minutes before the guy showed up in a traditional looking yellow taxi. I noticed the cab wasn't marked, no logo, number, rates or anything, but it had that taxi light thing on the top and in my young naive mind it seemed totally legit. He waved me over and I got in and asked him to take me to Fort Benning, finally feeling some relief. The doors auto-locked and I'll never forget the first thing that he said to me. He was silent until we got on the main road and said, Did you really think it was a good idea to call a number written in a sharpie? I froze and in retrospect, no, it wasn't the best idea I've ever had. But... I had so few options and didn't want to be stranded in a huge foreign city in the middle of the night. I don't know what else I could have done really. After a minute, I tried to laugh it off and just hope that he hadn't noticed that I was shaking. I reached for my phone before remembering that it was dead and realized that if something happened to me, no one would know if I had even made it to Georgia. Staring at me in the rearview mirror, the driver told me what was going to happen. Hey, so there's no use in getting to Benning this early. Uh, the post hotel isn't even open. Drive around with me for a while and hang out and I won't even charge you. I told him no thanks. I really needed to get to Fort Benning right away. He said no though and that was uh, that. We drove to a worn down apartment complex where he told me that he was picking up a regular to keep me company. I didn't really reply, I mean, what could I have even said? But at the time, although I wasn't raised religious, I was praying to God for some kind of miracle. And now came a woman who looked like a, a bit like a cliche prostitute. A tube top, mini skirt, smudged mascara and an unlit cigarette hanging from her lips. Short but ratty bleached hair too, a pockmarked face and cheap purse and... I have no idea who or what she truly was, but she got into the front passenger seat and lit her cigarette. She turned to look at me and said, Don't worry, he's cool. We're all cool. <laughs> and that helped, right? I had never considered jumping from a moving vehicle before until now, but even if I wanted to, the back doors were child safety locked and I couldn't open them. Trust me, I tried. I was trapped like a, a caged animal just waiting to die. I honestly felt just so stupid and so foolish at the time, sitting in the back seat of the cab with no idea what to do and no idea what was going to happen to me. I, I kept trying to rationalize it, downplaying the situation in my mind. I was too afraid and frozen to actually do anything and come to grips with the reality. As we were driving around, the girl was telling me about the driver, how he was ex-military and had started this cab business. What a down-to-earth fun guy he was and how lucky I was to be picked up by him. How I was cute and young and everything was cool, cool, cool. Her words were a bit slurred though and I knew that she was either drunk or high or something. And I really didn't want to know to be honest. We pulled up outside a small blue house sometime later. About an hour before the break of dawn and the driver told the girl to keep an eye on me while he went inside. I'm in full-blown panic mode at this point, the suspense of it all making it so much worse, so the girl offered me a cigarette to calm my nerves. I wasn't a smoker, but I said yes. She got out of the cab and opened my door, stumbling a bit before sitting on the curb and lighting another cigarette. She lit mine as I sat next to her and I started thinking about whether or not I could outrun her with my heavy backpack and how long the driver would be inside for. Without me asking, the girl told me the driver was inside showering in preparation. I asked what he would be showering and preparing for, but she just kept repeating how he was cool, how much fun we were going to have, and how cute I was. Then she said, Ranger Cab, because he was like a, a ranger or something, or maybe that was his dad, he's a good looking guy, military muscles, and on and on about all this stuff. Thankfully, God finally answered my prayer when the girl just slumped over and passed out in the grass. I saw the track marks on her arms and guessed that it was heroin or something. And apparently the driver was inside taking a shower and wasn't about to come back in the next few moments. So 
I grabbed my backpack and I ran like hell. I don't remember exactly what happened after I started running. I know I took off as fast as my feet would carry me and that I didn't dare stop to catch my breath. One minute I was sprinting for my life, lungs on fire, and then I was just trudging along with tears in my eyes as I walked through the Fort Benning gate with my military spouse ID asking how to get to the base hotel. Honestly, I wish I knew how I got there, but... I was in deep survival mode and I didn't stop to process any of it until I made it to my room. I don't know if someone gave me a ride or if I followed a map or what. I've never blocked a memory out like that before or ever again which is really weird. I told my husband everything when I finally saw him too and he uh, he didn't believe me at first. I mean I probably wouldn't have believed me either. And his lack of trust made me think that no one would take me seriously, so I just never went to the police. I still had the number that I dialed saved in my call history, and I knew the girl called it the Ranger Cab. What I didn't have was the confidence or support to report it. Sometimes I, I think back to that day and wonder what would have happened if that girl didn't let me just get out of the cab like she did. If she hadn't have passed out on the ground and if the driver just never stopped for a shower. But it's one mystery that I'll happily not ever get the answer to. So my fiancé and I, we, uh, we lease a small three-bedroom house in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee. The original owner's granddaughter is our landlady and my lifelong family friend to my fiancé's parents and... The original owner himself lived in the house until he passed. We've been in the house for about six months now and some, uh, some small things have happened. Just random cabinets opening in front of guests, lights being on when no one was home and all the lights were shut off before leaving and hearing distant conversation from another room where there's definitely no one else there and items falling off of shelves for no reason, things being relocated through the house and just your everyday haunted stuff. For the most part, I, I talk to the spirits and let them know that their presence is acknowledged whenever possible, but I ask them to be respectful of us as well, seeing as we have to live there and all. This has helped a lot of the activity calm down, but we still have a little here and there. Last weekend, though, my fiancé and I, we saw a shadow figure walk past our bedroom doorway while we were getting ready for bed. There's a nightlight in the hall that keeps it illuminated, we both wear glasses and I've walked into the wall at 2am trying to go pee in the dark before. But uh, we both saw it. We live in the country without neighbours and there isn't any traffic along our street that late at night so it wasn't passing headlights or anything. But a human shaped and human sized shadow just crossed the doorway. We talked it over and obviously we're a little bit shaken but eventually we, uh, we just went to bed. A few nights later, fiancé is snoozing hard and I'm awake at 3am and I see the shadow walk down the hallway again. I don't say anything or wake him but I mentioned it that morning before work and my fiancé says, oh you were probably just sleepy, maybe your eyes were playing tricks on you and then he playfully starts saying that there's nothing in our house except us and I think he or they decided to leave. Well, last night... He and I get ready for bed and hang our laundry in the closet and then I told him, playing around mind you, to close the closet and get into bed. He shuts the door and we both hear it latch and then closes the bedroom door and we get into bed. After about 30 minutes though, he and I are on the cusp of sleep but not yet all the way out and we, uh, we hear the doorknob click hard and then our bedroom door just opened, forcefully too. Hard enough to cause it to hit the wall, in fact. We both wake up and looked at each other and I kind of asked him, so do you think they're still gone? Obviously not. It definitely spooked us and the vibe in the house has changed a bit for some reason, but I, uh, I'm not sure what to do now. So I'm 24 and I live in Georgia and I served in the army and was blessed enough to be attached, not be a member but attached, basically a glorified intern, 
to special operations when I deployed to FOB Shank, Logar province in Afghanistan. I'm attentive, keep my cool, and don't like jumping to conclusions, and that's how good men and women die. I can't explain what happened, and I've talked to some friends of mine who are avid hikers, and we've had some good guesses, but nothing solid. And so, here's what happened. So me and a friend went to hike Blood Mountain here in GA. It's a short hike with a great payoff. Well, we go in the afternoon and get there around 2.30pm and stayed at the top of the hill till around 5.40ish to watch the sunset. Well, Jackass doesn't watch where he's going and gets a minor sprain in his ankle and now we're left descending at night. No problem though, I've hiked at night before by myself and honestly it's, it's great if you've ever done it. I recommend bringing a gun if you do though as I always carry except for this one hike. I forgot it at home at this time. So, we're talking and laughing and we get halfway down the mountain where there are these series of stone steps. I help him down and all of a sudden the hairs on the back of my neck just shoot up and I feel like I'm being watched. Just a super tense feeling. The best I can compare it to is when you're downrange and you're on patrol and you get this tense feeling before shit hits the fan. I don't say anything and I just keep walking and talking but... The feeling just lingers and I hear out for footsteps and I can hear our footsteps and something else following us. When we stop, it stops and when we walk, it walks. I just look around and pick up some rocks just in case. Well, we continue and notice something. It's completely dead silent. No animals, no owls and not even an insect. Obviously, it's fall and almost winter here and there's lower activity, but still, there is always something moving out there. I even start chucking rocks around to startle something and see if I can scare some sort of critter and then whatever is following us too. Well, nothing moves or makes a sound. and Honestly, that silence is one of the creepiest things to experience. But we keep moving forward and when we get to the beginning of the trail, this primal fear kicks in and I just want to run like hell but I try to keep my cool. In my mind I'm trying to calm myself down but my body is just rushing with adrenaline. Given by this point that I've accepted something is following us but it wasn't too scary. I was ready to just take action if needed. Well we make it out and on the way back home my friend basically tells me that he's experienced the same things that I did and Ask me what it was. He doesn't hike a lot and honestly really isn't much of an outdoorsman. I told him honestly that I don't know. In Georgia, we don't really have stalk predators like mountain lions or wolves or anything. I mean, the biggest thing that we have are black bears and you can hear them coming from a mile away. But whatever it was, was scary enough to scare all other wildlife in the area too and... I've never heard something like this happen before. But when I talk to my other friends, this is what we concluded. One, it's extremely rare, but mountain lions have been spotted here recently. Or two, the most likely thing is that it was a person. The only thing is, is that I don't know if any of those two are scary enough to scare all the wildlife from a mountainside away. But what do you guys think? I only know one thing, and... Making sure that I have my gun is now my number one on my hiking checklist. So I shoot archery and target shooting gets just so damn boring sometimes. So I would take a stroll through the woods and shoot trees and stuff. One time though it was probably early fall around 4pm on a Saturday and I heard some footsteps ahead of me. So I hid behind a tree and I'm a sophomore at the time so 160 pounds and 6 foot and I have a bow and arrow. Last thing I need is the cops after me and stuff so I stop and I wait and it turns out that it was a soccer mum and her family on a walk through the woods. So I chill out behind a tree just waiting for them to bug off so I can go home but the kids decide to stop and play. It had probably been about 10 minutes before I just say, fuck it, and I stash my bow and arrow under some leaves and just head home. 
I come back at night, uh, probably 9.30pm I'd say, and I walk along the trees until I reach the point in the woods that I'd stashed my gear and I had a flashlight on me and quickly found it. Now, I couldn't walk along the street to get home with my bow and arrow in hand and it was probably a half a mile walk and then a, a quarter of a mile walk through the woods too. The flashlight had a hook and a magnet on it so I strapped my quiver on and put the flashlight on my bow. I started making my way home and I noticed some deer ahead of me and I let them be because I knew how nasty bucks could be. They were acting funny though and they went running when I got closer and they would walk 20 or 30 feet ahead of me and wait for me just to get within range to see their bodies and I never actually saw them, uh, just their green reflective eyes. But by the look of how many eyes were there, there could have been at least 15 I'd say. As I started slowly walking home, I, I kept hearing noises too behind me, uh, leaves crunching, twigs breaking, and at this point I was on high alert. I would glance over my shoulder, but I wouldn't see anything, and it got to the point where I was walking with my bow drawn and an arrow ready. But when the sounds were within 10 feet behind me, I would spin around ready to shoot each time, just missing whatever it was, disappearing out of sight of my range of light, and always in a blur in my peripheral vision. I was panicking on the inside, but tried to stay physically calm and continued slowly walking home, just keeping an eye on the deer in front of me and an ear on the noises behind me. The thing behind me was actually making more noises than over a dozen deer in front of me at one point. As soon as I saw my house light, a glimmer of hope was flashing through me and then I, I hear thumping behind me before I turn and there's uh, at least 10 deer just blitzing past me. And that pushes me over the edge and I bolt for home and I cover 200 yards in a few seconds. I took a deep breath when I finally got there and relaxed my fingers and they were bruised and cut from holding my string so long and I put the arrow away and glanced at the woods and... I swear to you that I saw a set of red eyes about seven or eight feet off the ground and it was looking from behind a tree, which I knew its size so I could roughly tell how tall it was. I couldn't make out its body, although it was vaguely human, but it was darker than the surrounding area. Once I got inside, I, I learned that I had three missing arrows. I had all of them when I picked them up and my arrows are 32 inches long and my quiver 29 inches tall and none of them could have fallen out. Which means that something took them out as I walked through the woods. Only during the day over the next few weeks I, I found the arrows embedded in trees where I would shoot them all the time. And they would only go in a half inch but they were a foot in the tree at least. To this day... I don't know what it was and I don't go in the woods at night unless it's an emergency anymore. But that night though, I, I felt like whatever was behind me was just toying with me and potentially wanted to hurt me. If I'm in the wood during the days, I, I just feel uneasy these days. But if I'm near the woods or look at them at night, I, I can still feel that, that anger and rage. But this happened in a rural area of South Jersey and... If, uh, if any of you guys have had any experiences like this, uh, I'd sure like to know. This happened in April of this year, 2018. I live in a major city in Texas and my apartment complex is gated and in a good neighborhood. But the security isn't really tight, if that's the right word. Sometimes the gates are just left open and anyone could really piggyback off of someone else entering with the access code. Maybe twice in the past three years the management has put out notices of vehicle break-ins or other items being stolen from porches and whatnot. We also have frequent door-to-door -door solicitors even though there are signs forbidding it. So this particular Friday evening I go to bed around 2.30am. But for some odd reason though, I was having some trouble getting to sleep so I put on a podcast to listen to and eventually start to doze off. I become aware of a noise that sounds like a, a clicking sound but it sounds like one of my upstairs neighbours making some noise. So I kind of zone this out as I'm used to my neighbours staying up late on weekends anyway. After about 30 seconds though, I realise the noise is extremely repetitive and getting louder. 
I then start focusing on it more intently, trying to isolate what it could be and where it was coming from. When suddenly, it hits me. It's coming from the entrance to my apartment. I leap out of bed and head to the foyer and I identify the noise right away. The lock mechanism is moving back and forth rapidly, like someone is trying to unlock the front door. I can hear that an object is inserted into the lock and the person is jimmying it back and forth with a lot of force. I instinctively turn around and head to my bedside safe, unlock it with the combination and pull out a pistol. I load a 14 round magazine and chamber a hollow point round. I head back to the door and as I exit the bedroom I, I see the lock twist and unlatch. Well, I immediately pointed my weapon straight ahead knowing that if someone comes through I'll have to make a split second reaction. I also decide that if someone comes through that door, I'll give them a momentary chance to retreat, but if they do anything other than that or enter aggressively, I'm going to shoot and ask questions later. But they don't enter, however, because I had also locked the deadbolt, inside only. When I first moved in a year prior, I remember thinking that the deadbolt was a great security feature and I got in the habit of always keeping it locked when I'm home. In hindsight, this decision probably saved me from a life or death confrontation. Upon realizing that, I approached the door and looked through the keyhole, and on the other side are three Asians, two men and one woman. All three are wearing hoodies, so it's difficult to make out their faces though. The men have objects in their hands, but I can't make out exactly what it is. The two men are talking back and forth and probably trying to figure out what they can do to open the door even though they have successfully opened the outside lock at this point. The woman is also talking loudly behind the two men, so much so that anyone in the hallway would be able to hear her voice. She's talking in another language though, and the only words I can make out are pretty much apartment 250, and she keeps repeating that over and over like a broken record. Upon hearing that, I start to wonder for a moment if maybe they're just drunk and have the wrong apartment number or something. But that's impossible. To open my lock, they would have to have a, a copy of my exact key or some kind of lock picking device. I've never copied my key or given it to anyone for that matter. And here's the other thing. Not only is 250 not my apartment number, but as I figured out later, that apartment number doesn't even exist anywhere in the complex. Standing back from the door now, I take a long broom handle and jab it hard into the face of the door, letting them know that I'm on the other side. They immediately stop fiddling with the lock and take off running, and I debate whether to call 911 and decide against it, unless they return. I know that they'll be long gone by the time that anyone gets there anyway. It would be too risky to follow them to try and get a better description or license plate too, and I don't have enough identifying info as it is to make an arrest anyway. I file the police report the next day and let the apartment management know too. They said it was unusual, but they would alert the resource office and ask for police presence for a couple of nights. Nothing ever came of the report, but that's uh, not really a surprise if I'm being honest. It's been months since this happened and no further incidences. Nobody else in the apartment has reported anything similar happening and I, uh, I don't think that they'll be back. But one precaution I took was to buy a smart lock for the deadbolt so I can leave that deadbolt always locked from the inside, even when I'm not home. It's crazy to think that that deadbolt was the only thing between myself and an armed confrontation with intruders. They say you don't really know what you'll do in those situations until it really happens, but I can honestly say that I'm proud of how I stayed calm and was mentally prepared to defend myself. If there's one good thing that came out of this, I, I feel confident that I responded the right way and was ready for the unthinkable. My whole life, I've uh, always believed in the paranormal and I'm not really sure why I did because I was uh, never really religious, but I always just had a gut feeling. So... I moved into an apartment above a, a restaurant in 2017 and it's very open concept. My room is on the west side and beside it, my roommate's room and across the apartment, uh, an open doorway leading to the balcony in a third room. 
After getting settled in, I was really happy in the apartment and uh, small things started happening like my canvas painting falling off. The first time, I honestly didn't think much of it, but then it happened a few more times while I would be sitting on my bed. I decided to address it out loud and said, Hey, uh, I'd appreciate it if you could stop knocking my painting off. Uh, it was my father's and I would like to keep it intact. And after that, it no longer fell off. Every time I leave my room, my light from my room shines into the dark apartment and highlights the doorway at the other side of the apartment. A few months later, my other roommates moved in and I started seeing a, a dark figure right at the doorway. A dark male figure, I think. Probably around 6'2", and it didn't disappear right away even though I noticed it. The first few times I thought that it was just my imagination, but other people saw it too. Next, I ended up getting a couple of cats and one of my friends lived in the room by that doorway and she often reported hearing someone walk back and forth and the cats would often hang out there, meow in a weird tone and watch that area a lot and it was a bit strange. The most bizarre thing though that happened wasn't to me but was to my roommate who doesn't even believe in the paranormal of any sort. So there were a couple of plumbers working in the bathroom and she went to go walk into her room and there was a man, a dark figure sitting on the bed just facing her. She shrieked and it just uh, disappeared right before her eyes. I always kept an open mind to it and would frequently say out loud, I hope you enjoy it here, I'm trying not to disturb you, I would just like my peace and I felt pretty good in the house. I didn't see the figure after confronting it too a few times and there are times that I would put a, a cup or something small somewhere and when I would turn around it would be somewhere else, but that could have been my own fault. I noticed too that when changes would happen in the house, people moving out etc, that things would happen more. The last major event, my roommate, he replaced the girl who used to live by the doorframe that I talked about. He was getting settled, home alone, when all of a sudden his carpet blew across the room. He went out to investigate and the front door of the apartment had somehow blown open. We obviously tried to explain it away with airflow and stuff. Uh, somehow though, I, I think it just wasn't that. Either way, I, I moved out but I always wonder if uh, the things still happen there. I hope you enjoyed the story and I just wanted to get some insight on it and see what others think. So this happened when I was 18. I'm small, 5'1", 100 pounds, long brown hair and I think I used to believe that I was invincible. Like a little dog syndrome or something but that's, uh, that's changed now. It was a really hot summer day and as usual we decided to float down the river and have some drinks and laughs. This happened in Alberta on a big river. You always bump into many other people floating or kayaking on nice hot days there too. I was with my boyfriend, 23, male and a fit guy, and a group of about 12 people. We connect all of our different tubes together with a string and play music off of a phone and just enjoy the ride. The float can be about 4 hours to 8 hours, depending on the level of water and the flow of the river. We probably floated for about 3-4 to four hours when a few people became really drunk and some started drama. We'd had enough and decided that we would just hop off and swim to the nearest side with the road and just walk back. People hop off and ditch all the time, but they also have phones to call for a ride and whatnot. We got to the road and we, uh, we had no phones and no clothes, just bathing suits, pink bikinis, and just bathing suits, a pink bikini, and his board shorts, and we didn't have shoes and it was hot as hell out. We started walking anyway and the road was so hot that I felt like my feet were cooking. A boyfriend seemed fine or just uh, didn't complain like I did. After probably 10 minutes of moaning, my boyfriend agreed that we should try hitching a ride to town or get a little closer at least. He was from there and figured that we might just catch someone that he knows. Not too many cars were out and finally a truck pulled over. We walked up and... It was two men, probably in their early 30s, and they looked fairly normal, maybe a little disheveled and dirty like they'd partied hard all weekend, but apart from that, just regular guys. 
But the first thing that struck me as odd was they barely spoke to us and obviously stared at me like creep level. We didn't really worry though and just wanted to get back to civilization and relax. The driver got out and opened his door so the back door would open, one of those types of trucks, and we got in and he took off. We tried to make some small talk, especially my boyfriend, but these guys just acted like zombies. There were empty beer cans, like dozens, all over the floor and I was starting to get a little freaked out. Nothing more uncomfortable than when people don't answer you back during a conversation, right? And the driver kept glancing in the mirror at me and the guy in the passenger seat was leaning sideways to stare too and sometimes was answering back when we talked. I was squeezing my boyfriend's hand in fear and kept telling him with my eyes, let's get the hell out of here. I don't know if these guys knew that they were scaring us and if they got off on it but maybe 10 minutes passed and my boyfriend told them that we would like to stop here. There were some random houses in this area. The two men looked at each other and one shook his head no and then they, uh, they just kept driving. We were obviously mortified. My boyfriend was getting really scared and he told the guy to pull the fuck over a few times. A minute or so later, the guy suddenly turned into a back road that went up a slight incline and curved. I literally thought that we were about to be killed. I mean, I've never been so terrified in my life in fact. He stopped the truck and looked in the mirror again at me for probably a good 10 seconds. My boyfriend hit the back of his chair super hard and yelled, let us out. The driver opened his door and then opened our door and we got out so damn fast and just ran to the edge of the road. He stood there and stared at us too, looked at his friend and then got back in and they just sped away. I started crying after this and we hugged and calmed down and then started to walk down the road. Funny enough, we still had a ways to go, so we hitchhiked again, because we thought that what are the chances that we'd run into something like that again or feel so unsafe. And an old man came by and we got a ride with him into town and told him what happened. I guess the moral of the story is don't hitchhike, and at the very least, keep a phone on you always and just make smart choices. We should have just stayed with the group in other words. To this day, I'm not sure if those guys were just trying to weird us out or if there was something more sinister going on, but whatever the case, we were stupid and we should have been more careful. So bear in mind that when this event took place, the police were involved after and it was an ongoing thing for a little while. It was definitely the most shocking and obscure event in my life, and if you're a paranoid person who lives alone, then this may not be for you. So, I'm from Liverpool in the UK. Sometime around mid-2016, me and a friend went on a night out to celebrate his birthday. I had met this particular friend through another friend, and we got along pretty well, but this was the first time that we'd been out with just the two of us. We got into the town centre at about 11 and for anyone who's never been out into Liverpool, you'll know how busy it gets but it's a pretty fun night. We met with two girls who had been arranged to meet but after spending maybe an hour with them we sort of separated and I thought that that was that. About four in the morning we decided to call it a night and we headed to a taxi rank. As we neared the rank, the girls that we had met up with earlier, they were waiting too and so we just started talking again. We agreed to go back to my friends for some drinks and to just hang out a little longer too. The only strange or off thing about this was that there was this guy with the two girls and he seemed friendly, albeit a, a little bit off, but he wasn't saying much and he was just sort of tagging along. But against our better judgement, we agreed to let the guy tag along to our friend's flat. We were pretty drunk and we just didn't really plan ahead. We got in the taxi and after about a 10 minute journey we arrived at my friend's flat. My friend lived in a flat or house share sort of thing like a, a big old Victorian house with a shared kitchen and all that. We carried on drinking and hit it off with the girls and they were fun and easy to hang out with. All the while the guy that they were with just sat in silence with a, a drink occasionally laughing at something that had been said. 
even when we tried to include him in the discussions, too, he would just give a one-word answer and act uninterested, but he wasn't doing any harm and he wasn't really bothering anyone, so we didn't think too much of it. It was nearing about six in the morning and the girls had decided to sleep on my friend's couch, and I was going to take a taxi home as I was starting to sober up and really didn't feel like waking up on a couch still dressed from the night before. So, I called a taxi and left. A pretty normal night, right? Well, here's the fucked up part. About four hours later, my friend calls me in a panic saying that someone had broken into the flat, beat the two girls up severely, and smeared blood all over the doors in the kitchen units. As I was just waking up, I didn't really know what to do, so I told him to call the police and an ambulance to take the girls to hospital. As he was on the phone, I heard one of the girls shouting in the background, well, more screaming actually. The phone line went off and... I couldn't get a reply or answer till about another hour and a half, by which time I'd pretty much just fallen back to sleep, still drunk mind you. As it turns out though, the guy who had come back to the house with us, he was the one who had done this. He had pretended to let himself out to go home and hid in the house till everyone was asleep, and for whatever reason he beat the two girls up and broke a kitchen window, and doing this he must have cut himself and just wiped blood everywhere. One of the other flatmates had woken up as my friend was on the phone to me too and the guy was in her room looking through the wardrobes, also the place where he'd hidden for a while. He had shit on the floor and took a piss and there was shit smeared on the hallway banister also. He must have got out somehow when he heard people coming to the room and I'm not sure how as I wasn't really there. The police were notified obviously and the girls were taken to A&E. I thought that that would be it too but... The next day, my friend called me and we were pretty much still shocked about it, but we were just talking it out and discussing why or who the guy could have been. I got a text maybe uh, an hour or so after telling me and apparently the, the guy was back and he was standing in the garden and he was throwing little pebbles at the window and then running away. The girls who lived in the flat, they went to stay at a friend's house, but my friend who had a lot of valuables in the house wouldn't leave, so me and another friend went to keep him company. Literally, throughout the whole night, the guy was just throwing stuff at the windows too and banging on the doors. We managed to get a picture of him, but it was pretty blurry, and he had longish hair which made it hard to see him properly too. At about six in the morning, he started kicking the door too and screaming really loudly. We ran to the door and opened it, but he was already at the bottom of the path and spat in our direction and just walked away facing us. But we called the police again to tell them what had been happening, and that was that. Fast forward about six months later, and my friend calls me and tells me to check my Facebook inbox. He had sent me a news article. Apparently, the guy had been arrested for beating up and sexually assaulting prostitutes around five minutes from where my friend lived, and as somebody else had come forward saying that he had followed them home on a night out and pretty much done the same shit to them as he had done to us. But he was arrested and charged with quite a list of things and as far as I know is still in jail. Also, uh, the girls who were assaulted were fine eventually. The mental trauma was worse than the physical, I imagine. I don't know what this guy was doing or why he just smeared blood and piss and shit all through our house. I don't know if he was truly dangerous or if he was just on drugs or what, but it was for sure one of the strangest and scariest moments in my life. Oh, and uh, I forgot to include too that apparently he also had a knife to a female student's throat and forced her to strip, only stopping when a taxi driver stopped and had seen what was happening. So, uh, this just happened to me and I've been up for the past hour panicked. I woke up at 3.15 on the dot and checked my phone and I stretched and yawned and laid there for about 10 minutes not feeling a hint of being scared. So right now I'm also sleeping on the pullout in the living room with my girlfriend and my sister is in her room and there is an empty bedroom, stepdad is, stepdad is out for the night and bathrooms and whatnot. So I'm facing the whole apartment if that makes sense and when I'm laying I can see the dining room, the half kitchen and the very small hallway where the three doors are to the rooms. 
mind you, I'm wide awake at this point and I'm scrolling on my phone and I roll over to face the wall and the window. I'm not laying there for more than five minutes when I hear a, a creaking of a door, even though everyone's asleep. I brush it off thinking that it was the heat or something and that's when I hear, clear as day, right in front of the girl's room, a, a voice say hello. I whip around on the bed and I see absolutely nothing. I listen really hard, which is easy to do in a dead silent apartment, and I hear my sister snoring. I know the voice was not my sister's as it sounded nothing like her, but trying to calm myself down, I, I just tell myself that it was my sister just talking in her sleep again or something. So I, I lay back down, and this time I face the apartment again, back to the wall. I rest my head on my pillow and again begin to scroll on my phone, and... That's when I hear what I would call a, a goblin-like voice, and that's all I can imagine as it sounding, and something grumbled high-pitched, and it wasn't like a significant word or phrase, but it was like a jumble of words, and I instantly felt sick. It was a feeling of anxiety and dread and fear all at once. I've had paranormal experiences before where I believe that I've seen a ghost in the apartment before this one, but... I would have to say that this was the most terrifying thing to ever happen to me. It was about an hour ago and I know exactly what I heard. It almost sounded like a laugh if that makes sense and I don't want to sound like I'm making any of this up but it sounded like a, a different language maybe. I'm planning on going and getting sage today to go around the house and say some prayers and whatever I can do because I'm freaked out. I did check on my sister twice just to make sure that nothing was in there and she was okay and she was sound asleep the whole time. I woke my girlfriend up too and we walked around the apartment just to be safe and I'm, uh, I'm absolutely sure of what I heard which is what I think terrifies me the most. If someone had an idea of an explanation then I'd love to hear it to ease my mind. Also um, I'm going to try and leave my phone on recording tonight to see if I can get anything. Then tomorrow I'm, I'm going to try and smudge the place, but wish me luck. During my freshman year of college in New Hampshire, a girl in my dorm hall accidentally caused a, a small dorm room fire by leaving popcorn too long at like 3am or something. But we all had to evacuate and the fire trucks came and the RAs made a pretty big stink about it. The girl who lit the fire was the subject of many yik yak jokes and I felt bad for her because she really really wasn't attractive and she looked uh, pathetically lonely and plus causing microwave fires seemed like a pretty innocent mistake for such harsh comments. A couple of days after the incident I saw her in the resident hall and made casual small talk by asking her how things were popping and kind of just checking up on her because I felt bad. She laughed and that was kind of it. My conversation of about two minutes max. Fast forward to a week later and I hear a knock at my dorm room door and the same girl, who I'm now going to refer to as Popcorn, comes literally running into my room with no hesitation. I didn't even really tell her my room number and at the time I just figured that she just saw me go in there once because she didn't even know my name at this point. It takes me a second to realize that she's in full-blown tears. And so, there's now a stranger on my bed in tears and I'm just like, uh... So, I counsel her like the bleeding heart I am and ask what's wrong. She tells me that the black dining hall cook just sexually assaulted her and the college wouldn't fire him and she was suffering emotionally because of it. Being a victim of assault myself, I really sympathized with her situation and... Gave her my phone number in case she needed uh, help walking to the dining hall with a safety net or whatnot. I don't take sexual assault lightly. The night after our conversation in my room, I got a call from her to walk her to the dining hall because the black cook that assaulted her was working that day. I walked her down to get food and she just lit up like a glow stick and my whole new person emerged. It didn't matter that her assaultant was in the room. She was talking my ear off about Pretty Little Liars, One Direction, and 
Just uh, a lot of things I really didn't care about, but... But then again, she had no one to talk to and the situation was complicated. So I just listened and nodded my head. Over the course of about two weeks, give or take, I had walked her down to the dining hall about maybe four or five times, I'd say. She may have been a victim of assault, but she was also a very annoying and unappealing person. I mean, for shit's sake, she actually talked about herself in third person. Her story about the assault became inconsistent and there was always new major developments about what happened and that the story was changed to something much more drastic and severe. It went from assault to full-on gang rape as her story developed. Then one day she made a really racist comment and it made me immediately uncomfortable and unsettled. After this I, I didn't want to walk her down or interact with her anymore either. The week of Thanksgiving reprieve, I went back home to visit my family while Popcorn stayed on campus. During that week, I had 60 missed phone calls from Popcorn. One day specifically, I even had 20 plus calls in the span of a couple of hours. No normal person would do that, and red flags definitely were raising if they hadn't been already. When I got back to campus, there was a knock on my door and sure enough it was Popcorn crying again. She tells me that because I wasn't on campus to protect her, she was raped by a Muslim guy while walking to Panera Bread and the Filipino RA groped and slapped her boobs. If the red flags weren't being raised, then this was full-on sirens. I'm no rape apologist by any means, but the rape-to-ratio rate was exceptionally high with this one, especially since these three assaults happened within a month's time frame all by people of color seemingly at random. She was making these stories up to elicit some sick form of sympathy and as an actual victim of assault, I was beyond offended. I told her that I had to leave for class and ran the fuck off to my friend to ask for advice. It got really crazy really fast too and I warned the RA officers about her and they told me that they would talk to her. During class, I was up to a hundred missed phone calls too and a series of individual messages that just said hi. And at this point, I was done with this shit. I wanted nothing to do with her anymore and I blocked a number and just went back to my dorm. That week after classes, I just went straight to my dorm too and I didn't want to see her but one day I had to go to the bathroom so I walked to the stall to do my business. I'm just casually in there peeing with my pants around my ankles when Popcorn literally fucking crawls on the bathroom floor and dips her head underneath the stall door and says, Ha, huh, I knew you would eventually come out. I'm freaked the fuck out obviously and am in near tears at this point. I tell her that I'm obviously wicked busy and I don't have time for her and that I was upset for invading my privacy. It took a lot of courage to do that because I struggled deeply with confrontation. She tells me all about how she's thinking of dying because her mum died when she was young. Some manipulative shit that I was just not in the mood for. So I leave her in the bathroom and go to my room and lock the door. I watched some YouTube and took a nap when I was rudely awakened by not knocking but pounding on my door. I didn't answer obviously but the pounding just continued and got louder until... She said, open this door or I'm going to kill you. And she just waited and waited outside my dorm singing songs in the door cracks for an hour. I was so scared I, I just cried and called my dad to pick me up from school. I didn't have many friends that lived on campus since it was a small college and a lot of people commuted and this whole situation just made me feel really isolated. My mental health was deteriorating rapidly and the RAs had been informed of the threats made at my door by other students observing what happened and she was given a warning but that was it. But one night I had my boyfriend who lived three hours away at the time come to spend the night at the college with me. But we had been watching a movie and were now napping on my bed when we all hear the door open. Like an idiot I had completely spaced out and just forgot to lock the door. And Popcorn comes running in and jumps on top of us and says in a baby voice, Popcorn wants cuddles. I was beyond creeped out and basically screamed, what the fuck? 
my boyfriend, being the non-nonsense confrontational person that he is, told her to just get the absolute fuck out of my room. She told him that she would, and I quote, just go and die like her mother did when she was three and inject cancer into herself. My boyfriend actually smiled and said good, and then just pushed her out of the room and slammed the door giving zero fucks. I swear that he almost slammed her finger shut in fact, and uh, I love him for that. We reported her to the campus police in the morning, and still, nothing major came of it. That was, until there was another popcorn fire in her dorm not too far after, and she got kicked out. And I wish that that's where the story ends with her, but unfortunately not. So after she left the dorms, my resident life became a lot easier. I made a lot of new normal friends, and I was feeling a lot less anxious. One day a girl in one of my classes invited me to go to the mall with her to go out to get her nails done. Now, this nail salon had clear glass, so you could see the rest of the outside mall when you were getting your nails done. I'm more relaxed when, all of a sudden, I, I see Popcorn's fucking face pressed up against the glass of the nail salon and she's with a morbidly obese neck beard. I'm getting my nails done and she's just literally staring at me through the window for a good 10 minutes with this guy. To say that I was unnerved was an understatement. I told my friend what was going on and we booked it out of there and they tried hard to follow. In retrospect, that's when I should have called the real police. But after the mall, I had a bunch of random friend requests from profiles with a small Yorkie dog as the profile pic and several message requests. I opened them and they were from Popcorn, asking me to be her bridemaid at a Pizza Hut wedding that her and her fiancé were having in two years. I mean, you can't even make this shit up, right? There was another message about how she was so upset that I didn't acknowledge her at the mall and she had waited so long to introduce me to her doting fiancé and she was so upset with me that she wanted to wring my neck. Of course, I blocked all those profiles and things went pretty silent. I've been living with my boyfriend and going to school in Rhode Island for two years currently and I'm loving school and I have an excellent group of friends. About five months ago I had got home from work and I had three missed calls from a random New Hampshire number. Thinking it was one of my family members I called back and nope it was popcorn on the other end and I just immediately hung up. There was also a voicemail left that was just a person breathing into the phone and telling me that I was expected at the wedding. I cried and called the police urgently about the number and I don't know what happened or if anything did come of it but I haven't been bothered since then. I'm a very kind person and people often take advantage of my openness. It really is a fatal flaw that I'm working really hard on. It's unfortunate there are so many unhinged and lonely people, but we really shouldn't make it our burden to help them. Sometimes, being nice can actually cause a lot of mental strain and even put you in danger like I was. To start off, I'm a 19-year-old female and at the time of this story, I was around 15. I want to make it clear too that I've had many encounters with the paranormal before but this one was the most terrifying yet. So every year for work my mother has a convention at a hotel that was built in the late 1700s and the place is massive and overall really elegant. Since her work has been going there for years our family gets a discount whenever we want to venture there for a vacation. This was my first time at the hotel and I instantly loved it. With me was my father, my brother, and of course my mother. When we first got into our room, there was a dreadful feeling that I got whenever I entered my room alone, so I tried to only go in there with my brother. We had a lot of fun eating gourmet food, getting a spa treatment, and wandering around the hotel grounds. I was outside one day with my camera and decided to take a picture of the main building, and as I was looking through the camera... I noticed uh, the tiny windows at the top of the building. But nothing unusual, just windows to the old maid's quarters, my mum said, but I still got a weird feeling from just looking at them, and it didn't help that most of the windows were broken or even open in the dead of winter. 
One night, after dinner, my mother and I decided to walk around the interior of the hotel while my brother and dad rested in their room. It was around 8pm and there were only a few people, especially if you strayed away from the main entrance. We took our time walking around and looking at the various rooms including a movie theatre that we both refused to enter. Before we headed to bed, we decided to go to the very top floor to look out from the windows to get a better view of the town below. We entered the nearest elevator and pressed floor 16. As we were going up, my brother called us to ask us where we were and my mum and him started chatting. All of a sudden, the elevator doors opened and we were both frozen in place. The door opened and we both got hit with just this incredibly cold breeze, along with a pitch black room. We both immediately pressed a different floor because we could sense that we weren't supposed to be there. I squeezed my eyes shut because I was so scared that something was going to pop out at me and suddenly the doors close and we both start to relax. But all of a sudden, the numbers on the elevator's display panel just started going crazy. It was rapidly displaying two, then various other numbers, including those that weren't even listed as a button on the elevator. I got so scared and my mother and I were hanging on to each other in complete terror. By this time, my mother was on the phone with my brother and we had no idea what was going on. All of a sudden, the panel displays floor 15 and the doors open up. Not wanting to stay on the elevator, we just decided to use the stairs at this point. As we started making our way to the stairs, I, I start to feel like uh, this presence behind us. I let my mother know what I'm sensing and she just tells me not to look back and walk as fast as possible. That statement freaked me out even more though because my mum usually doesn't feel that kind of energy. As we're making our way down the stairs I decide to look back and what I saw will stick with me forever. I saw a, a tall black mist like a shadow figure a few feet behind us. It didn't have any features and seemed to just be standing still, like deathly still. We kept running until we hit the main floor and we could finally breathe and we decided to look at the elevator to see if the floor we selected had a, an employees only sign but it didn't. On our way back to our room we figured out that we must have accidentally made our way up to the old maid's quarters or something which honestly sent chills up my spine. My mum also came to the conclusion that the cold air must have just been the winter air making its way through the broken or open windows. I agreed, but the cold air just felt different from the crisp winter air from outside. But I must admit that I could have just imagined that. When we got back to our room, my brother asked what happened and we told him the whole story. All of a sudden, he looked at us with a, a weirded out look on his face and he told us that while on the phone with my mum when the elevator doors opened, he heard a bunch of whispers come through our end. This freaked me out so much and I opted to sleep in my mother's room the rest of the trip. Nothing else happened, mind you, during our vacation and we left a few days later, but I was completely scared the whole time. My mum still has her convention there every year and now that I'm employed with her, I, I go as well. Whenever I do go, though, I... I always experience things, but nothing near that extreme. If you want to hear some stories from my family's experiences at that hotel, then please let me know in the comment section below, because I know I would love to get them off my chest. Anyway, thanks for listening guys, and uh, I hope you enjoy. This happened in early 2016 when I was living with my mom and stepdad and my two adopted sisters. I was 19 at the time, male, and for a little backstory, my job at the time was doing security work in different parts of a west coast metropolitan city. At the time, we were leasing a three bedroom home with a giant living room, one of the bathrooms barely fits one person and has a small window, included inside is a metal wire shelf thing that holds all of my stuff like gel, toothbrush, razor, etc. But my neighbours would hardly speak to each other and would never be home assuming that they'd be at work. This will be important. 
This event occurred when I had just gotten off work doing a 12 hour graveyard shift, 6pm to 6am and of course I was tired as all hell so I quickly drove home, said hi to my mum while she made breakfast and I slumped my way to my room and just knocked out with my uniform on, black polo, tactical pants and tactical boots. I didn't even close the door to my room, that's how tired I was. Now, Every day my mum and stepdad leave to work along with my sisters. They need to head off to school at around 7am. That's usually when I have my freedom and play my PS4, yell at strangers or friends through the mic and whatnot, but not this morning. I decided to just catch up on my sleep. But I half sleepily awoke to a, a series of hard fast knocks on our wooden door. And mistake number one was that I ignored it and thought that it was a salesman or one of those religious people. Sometimes my stepdad comes home to get lunch too, but he has a key to the house, so no worries, I thought, and I just quickly fell back to sleep. I awoke again sometime later, though, to sudden sounds of loud footsteps just running on the wood floor towards the door and the door slamming shut as loud as it possibly can. And that was mistake number two. Okay, it, it must have been my stepdad running late to work after his lunch break. No biggie. After my slumber, everybody came home and started preparing for dinner while I hopped on some PS4. My mum comes in with a, a very serious face and says, Did someone break into the house? Did you leave any time today? I say, No, why? I, I was just sleeping until everyone came back. She says, Okay, come and have a look at this. My mum takes me to the little bathroom from the earlier description and I looked up to the little window and cold air breezing through a broken frame and broken hinges. I looked at the metal wire shelf and there was a dent on top as if someone bent it while climbing in. And I felt my spine tingle as it hadn't really hit me at that moment until then. I thought back to what I heard while I was asleep and I told my mum that I heard someone knocking earlier and I heard my stepdad come back to get something before leaving in a rush and slamming the door. My mum says, son, stepdad didn't go to the house today. And my throat clenched and my stomach dropped. My fingertips felt as if they had been frozen and I felt as if my whole body was sinking down into a deep dark abyss in the ocean. I couldn't say anything and we just stared at each other for an eternity. We started checking the whole house though to see if anything had been taken and nothing. Everything was as is. We asked a few neighbours if they had seen anything but they obviously weren't home and we gave the local PD a tip just to let them know and they already had knowledge of this that this person is still out there too. My mind kept racing though about what just happened. Why wasn't anything taken and why did this mystery burglar decide to run off? We came to the conclusion that this person knocked first to see if anyone was home, but seeing as I didn't answer, they did their duty and stepped into our house, and since I snore really loud, this person might have thought that there was a dog inside the house or something. Another possibility would be that this person saw someone in a uniform and didn't want to mess with me, or just simply the fact that I was in the house or something. There were many possibilities that could have unfolded too, and... It's not exactly clear what this burglar's intentions were. Were they just to grab everything valuable and leave, or what if this maniac was stepping into my house with intentions other than stealing? The thought of someone watching me sleep from about five feet away gets me so anxious no matter where I am. This event made me realize that no matter who you are, you will always be vulnerable when you aren't alert of your surroundings. Now, I'm a 5'11 guy and I'm an average build kind of dude. It's safe to say I could have held my own against someone who was trying to break in. Along with my plethora of bludgeoning and bladed weapons, it could have gone down pretty easily. But even if you're armed to the teeth, you'll never know when someone will be watching you and planning something ill-mannered. There are things and people out there that have been shielded away from most of us. Especially in this day and age. You'll just... Never know who could walk past down the street. I'm now 22 and married with a one-year-old son and a daughter on the way and this is something that I've learned from and I'll be teaching my son and soon-to-be daughter to be aware of their surroundings and 
to not see the bright side of strangers just trying to do them a good deed, that they'll never know what their true intentions might be. This goes out to anyone listening to this. Please, just watch your surroundings and be careful. So, uh, this just happened to me about 20 minutes ago, I'd say. I work in New York City and live in New Jersey, and as I was going on my way to take the bus by Port Authority, I saw a bus that was closer than the usual bus I take. But the bus driver was outside bringing people into his car, and it had the same shape. It was a street away, and it was parked on a different side of the road. I thought it was odd, but I just wanted to get home. As I get in and sit down, I realize that this bus is really odd. It doesn't have the usual stickers and markings and or lights like the usual buses do and it's uh, it's really tiny. I realize that this bus, it might be a fake and just as I realize this, uh, a guy comes running up to the bus saying, it's a fake, it's a fake. And that's when I knew my hunch was right and an older woman and I tried to get out. But then, the supposed bus driver that's still outside barricades the door. He puts his arms over the door and won't let us leave and he told us no. So, I told him to fuck off and pushed him. But both the woman and I just ran the hell out of there and onto the right and real buses. I don't know what that guy's intentions were, but have you guys ever seen or heard anything like this? So this is my dad's story. So after he was done in Vietnam, he was soon stationed at an air force base in Greenland. They had really bad blizzards often there and when they came through, the base shut down and every section of the barracks would take roll call. But these blizzards were intense and there were cables running between all the buildings that you attached your person to with a carabiner so if there was a sudden whiteout, you didn't get lost and die. They had actually had people die literally 20 meters from shelter because they got lost in bad weather and just froze. He said that for about five months, every time they locked down for weather, they would hear this like horrendous screaming outside. Everyone was accounted for, so they didn't risk sending anyone out to investigate. But they all wrote it off as some sort of an animal, but every time that this was heard, the engine room would be wrecked tools everywhere, paperwork all over the floor, tables and toolboxes knocked over. Even one time, a, a several thousand pound jet engine had been lifted from its workbench, a crane thing, and just smashed almost 30 feet away. But the hangars and engine room had cameras covering every single possible entrance with spotlights that made them clear even in a whiteout. And there were no animals and no people and no anything was ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. And then one day it just stopped. And mind you, this was not something that they just shrugged at. It cost a lot of money and threw a wrench in at least one surveillance routine which caused a lot of brass from the DOD and the CIA to breathe fire down the base commander's neck. But this facility, a beyond military function, served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. But there was a, a full investigation using all manner of scientists, engineers and specialists and they came up with no satisfactory explanation for what was happening. I don't believe in the paranormal and nor did my father but this is the only spooky type story that he has from 22 years in the service. But no one knows what happened and it was really strange in every way. Hundreds of people wrote reports and documented it too and it wasn't just some... Uh, a grease monkey scratching their heads and randomly guessing if you catch my drift. That said, I, I spoke to my mum too and she told me a couple of things that I missed. So, after one of these occasions, the U2 in the shop had all its electronics turned on. And many of the systems in this plane were specially built for this airframe and this particular crew's mission. But these systems were complex and really archaic and... Very few people knew how to operate this machinery and the only ones on the base that could were two engineers and its crew. It wasn't a simple matter of hitting power buttons and just flipping switches from off to on or anything. Another time, three barrels of hydraulic fluid just vanished and they were never found. But they doubted the screaming noise was wind because it apparently came in short irregular bursts and winds never produced those sounds again. 
They theorized it was a polar bear, but if it was, its uh, coincidental timing was extremely uncanny. Also, uh, Control picked up a bunch of weird interference and anomalous readings that, again, had the uncanny timing of happening only when this was going on. But they were never able to reproduce those errors in a controlled manner, too. The whole situation was really creepy and really bizarre, but I'm not convinced it was supernatural and that the answer simply isn't wind. To this day, though, no one knows exactly what happened there, and I guess uh, we may never know. Anyway, thanks for listening, guys. This happened on Halloween when I was about 11, I'd say. My friend and I decided to go trick-or-treating. Yeah, we were a little bit old, but we just wanted some free candy. I lived in a very nice neighborhood, one of the ones where everyone gives out the full-size candy bars, so it wasn't unusual to have a lot of people come here to trick-or-treat. However, that also meant that there was about an acre of front yard for each house, so it took about three minutes to walk between each door. It was a good night for Halloween weather-wise, not too chilly, not rainy or anything, and this is important later. So, it's approaching about 8.30pm and after hanging around on the golf course and appreciating our candy haul, we decided to start heading home and call it a night. The street that I live on is a gigantic U-shape, like a little over half a mile walk from the top of the U down to the bend to the other side. We were walking towards the end of the U further from my house as we wanted to take the long way since it was such a nice night. It's about 9pm now so no one else is really out anymore at this point and people turned off their porch lights too, the universal signal for no more trick or treaters. That's when we notice a, a lone white van parked on the street. We made a joke about how it looks like one of those stereotypical kidnap vans with the painted windows and everything and that's when we noticed it shift out of the park and slowly creep down the street towards us and park at the next house. I said, huh, they must have had kids trick-or-treating or something. It wasn't uncommon for people to drive their kids from house to house since they were so spread out in our neighborhood, but given that it was 9pm and a night with nice weather, it struck us all as a bit odd. We checked every few minutes and it seemed to be just stopping from house to house like normal. We turned around again and kept walking at a leisurely pace, gossiping and all that stuff. And that's when we hear the car squeal as it moved forward down the hill and park again. This time, only about two houses away from us now on the opposite side of the street. Again, weird time to trick or treat, but whatever. And that's when we realized though that there were no kids getting out of the van. Not even once. Now, this was before my first phone, a red and white Samsung. We were only 15 minutes from my house, but we were a bit disturbed, so we walked to the nearest door and rang the bell and stuck our bags out in an attempt to act normal. A woman opens the door just a crack and then proceeds to berate us for trying to trick or treat at this hour, and slams the door before we could even say a word. <laughs> Thanks, lady. We turn around and the van is right there now parked in the wrong direction on our side of the street. The windows are tinted too, so we can't see the guy driving. Trying to keep our cool, we casually walk from the door and up the street into the cul-de-sac loop that's on the side of the street that makes up the bigger U. If you cut through that loop and hop a couple of fences, you can end up at my back door. The van goes the same way, and now we know that he's following us since there's no reason for him to go up this side street otherwise. We break into a sprint at this point, and I am by no means athletic, but I hop those fences like a fucking Olympian. We run inside my house, lock all the doors, and freak out while we sit in the front hall. Not five minutes later, the van slowly drives down the street past my house. We stress eat our candy and think of what would have happened if we hadn't have been aware of our surroundings at the time. We also kept an eye out for the rest of the night, but we never saw that van again. Not now and never again in that neighborhood. Which just goes to show that that van, it wasn't from around normal town. So 
Six years ago, I had just graduated nursing school and had not gotten my certification yet, so while I studied and waited for my test date, I worked as a CNA. I was living with my fiancé, who is now my dear husband, but he had just graduated from school and his sports broadcasting degree and was working a paid internship, which honestly just paid like crap. So, we were living in a one-bedroom apartment in a not-so-great neighborhood. The complex itself was Section 8 housing as well as a housed offenders when they got out of the local prison, something we didn't learn until after we had already lived there for a few months. However, we befriended many of the residents, our neighbours to the right, a young single mother on Section 8 with two kids who worked two jobs became a very good friend and we still keep in contact with to this day. Our neighbour to the left was an ex-con, a guy named Ramon that worked at a bakery. He often bought us bread and donuts that he got free from work. Then, Jake moved in. He resided in the unit across from us and I was home the day that he moved in. I was outside of our apartment just sitting on a folding chair reading a magazine enjoying the nice spring day. First thing I noticed was that he had an electric monitoring bracelet on. He also was a, a scary looking guy. He was only 5'8", but he had long greasy blonde hair, a, a pockmarked face, and his facial tattoos put Post Malone to shame to be honest. He saw me sitting there as he moved things into his house and he came over to where I was sitting and... I grabbed my magazine to go into the house and he started talking to me. Just polite things and so I decided to be nice even though my red flag meter was going off. He introduced himself as Jake and I gave him my nickname, not my actual name but what others call me and he started asking me if I lived alone and other more personal things so I gave a hasty answer of no, my fiance lived here as well and then just excused myself. I noticed though that he was still standing out there just staring at my door so I quickly closed the shades and just went to watch some TV. Later on when my fiancé was home I told him about Jake too and how he was just staring. My fiancé told me to just be careful and that he would walk me in from work as we both left at the same time anyway. For a while uh, things were good. I never saw Jake and I think fiancé ran into him once. Then I ended up passing my nursing exam and I also got a better paying job. Fiancé was hired by the network that he was interning for and things were looking up and we found an apartment that we could afford in a nicer part of town with a doorman and everything. We bid adieu to the complex and the friends we made there and moved into our new place. I thought my days of ever seeing Jake again were over at that point. But one day while working my job in the busy ER I... I saw a familiar face. It was Jake and he had taken an overdose of meds and was on a 24 hour observation. But there was not a room available for him so he was kept in the ER and I went in to take his vitals and he recognized me and he went off on me about how I moved out without saying goodbye and how much he missed me. Just crazy things being that we barely knew each other and had really only talked that one time. I explained myself to the charge nurse and she got someone else to babysit him as I did not feel comfortable. After my shift ended I headed out to my car and I was about to get in when I saw Jake walking briskly towards me. I got in my car and locked it and started by the time that he made his way over. He started hitting the car and banging my trunk and slapping the windows and shouting at me to open the fucking door. I drove off but not before he got one good kick to my bumper. I was terrified to go to work for a while too and I insisted that security escort me to and from my car. Three months had passed with no sign of Jake and I started relaxing and I walked to and from my car by myself. One day I'm heading to my car when someone bumps into me, like they were trying to bump my hip but I'm tiny, only 5'2 and was 110 pounds at the time so I lost my balance and just went flying. I twist my ankle and I'm grabbing it when I look up ready to tell whomever did it off when I see that it's Jake. His hair had been cut but he looked manic and he was staring weirdly at me. I hit the panic button on my car and he just took off running at this point. After that, I, I went to the police and I got an RO against him. 
He ended up breaking the RO by approaching me again at work, this time thankfully when I was around several co-workers and he uh, ended up going to jail for breaking the RO and breaking parole. He was released last year though according to his parole officer who actually contacted me and thankfully we live in a state away from there now and he never knew my full name. Which just goes to show that my intuition or just giving him my nickname, it may have saved me a lifetime of pain. This happened quite a few years ago when I was a relatively young and sheltered high school student. But probably 15 years old I'd say. Some of my close friends and I decided to go to the drive-in movie theatre one night. Where they show two movies in a row and the whole shebang ends pretty late at night. But probably around 1am or so. The five of us all drive in my friend Aaron's car and as we're putting the seats down and setting the back of the car up with blankets and pillows, Erin recognizes a guy, David, that she had met a few times because he worked at a gym. He was at the drive-in alone, but not necessarily weird, just not something many people do in my town, and came over to our car to chit-chat. Immediately, one of my other friends, Corinne, took a liking to this guy and began flirting up a storm. And it wasn't long until Corinne invited him to watch the movie with us, inside of Aaron's car. It also wasn't long until this guy David offered us, 15 and 17 year olds, alcohol, which we accepted. But looking back now, that should have been a red flag. But I was wary of this David character though, as he appeared a lot older than us, mid-twenties, and gave me somewhat of a, a weird vibe. But since Aaron seemed to know him and my friends weren't acting alarmed, I, I didn't give too much thought to it, I guess. So we're not even 15 minutes into the movie and I'm just too uncomfortable to be enjoying myself and six people are crammed into the back of one car and Corinne and David are cuddling and flirting and who knows what beneath the blankets. And it made me want to get out of there ASAP. So when David suggests that me and my three remaining friends could watch the movie in his car while he stayed in Aaron's car and canoodled, I jumped to take him up on his offer. So David's car was a, a small sedan with pretty much no room, so we had to sit in the seats normally as if we were about to ride in the car. Although I was a little uncomfortable sitting in the driver's seat with the steering wheel between me and the screen, I was glad to finally have some personal space. But that all changed when I dropped my phone and it landed somewhere underneath the driver's seat. While blindly reaching underneath to find my phone, I grabbed onto an object hard that I realized was a lot heavier than my iPhone when I began to lift it up. And to my complete and utter surprise, I realized that it's a gun. I had never seen a real life gun before at that point in my life, so it could have been a fake or maybe a BB gun or whatever else, but it looked real and felt real and was hidden underneath the driver's seat for easy access. And it freaked me out because even if it was a fake gun, what could he be intending to use it for besides intimidation? But for whatever reason, my friends didn't find this as startling as I did and they managed to calm me down a bit and concluded the best thing to do was to just put it back underneath the seat where I found it. And that was fine to me as I didn't plan on ever being in this car once again after the movie was over and definitely didn't plan on being in the car when David was in it ever. But the rest of the two movies went by fine and we're drinking the beer that this David character so kindly provided to us and we're just having a fun time. It's late by the time that the second movie ends and I'm ready to get back to our friend Erica's house where we were sleeping for the evening. I hop out of David's car, ready to get back into Aaron's car when I see Aaron's car already driving away. Corinne pops up and cheerfully announces, David has offered to drive us home, how nice of him right? Having no other way to get home and being slightly intoxicated and watching the rest of my friends pile into the car, I followed suit, even though I, I had my hesitations, I must admit. David sat in the driver's seat and I sat behind David and Corinne sat shotgun, beginning to play her signature Justin Bieber playlist through the speakers. The car ride started out normal enough with Erica giving directions to her house and Corinne not paying attention to anything but her Bieber and me feeling uneasy and hyper aware of the situation. 
As we're approaching Erica's house, David asks if we have time to take a quick drive up to the reservoir, which was located on the outskirts of town, but very isolated and surrounded by a heavily wooded area. It's probably close to 2am at this point too, and the only person who even slightly knew this random man has left us, and I know that there's a very real looking gun underneath the seat of this guy's car that he doesn't know I know about. So, of course, I say no. But... David just says, we're going up to the reservoir. Confused and alarmed, I start politely protesting, saying that we really don't have time and we're expected at home and yada yada. But with every word I say, David just turns the volume of the music up louder and louder, drowning out my voice and obviously ignoring me as he starts to head up the long dark road that leads to the reservoir. Well, I go into panic mode at this point annoyed that none of my friends are doing anything, especially Corinne who is still singing along to Bieber. I start to freak out and I decide that he cannot take us up to the reservoir, he just can't. I mean, what if the gun is real and he threatens us with it or worse? What if the gun isn't real but he still uses it to threaten us to do something? A million thoughts race through my head and I won't let him take us to a secluded area where any number of things could happen and no one could hear us. I decided that if he's going to do something to us I would rather risk it being here, in town or more populated road where our chances of survival or whatever are better. And so I literally freak out. All sense of politeness that I felt I needed to have is gone now and I started kicking the back of his chair with both of my feet, screaming at the top of my lungs that he needs to take us back now. I roll down the window and start shouting, trying to cause a scene, doing anything that I can do to just try and stop this man from driving us up to the middle of nowhere. I don't stop kicking and screaming until he finally relents, almost scoffs and says fine, as if I was some sort of crazy lady completely overreacting to the situation. To be honest though, I don't care what he thinks. I'm just relieved that he's turned the car around and is actually taking us back to Erica's house. But once we get there and run out of the car, we wake up Erica's parents to let them know what happened since this guy now has one of our addresses. I didn't sleep that whole night too and my friendship with Corinne was irreparably damaged from her putting me in such a terrifying situation just because she had the hots for this guy. Up until the point where he started driving us up that dark road to the reservoir, I was, uh, I was actually pretty sure that the guy was harmless. But when he began ignoring me and saying that we were going anyway, despite all my protests, something was really off about the situation. 